everybody, and welcome back to Sports Speak, episode 117. I'm Eddie Kalegi. And I'm Tim Moore. Hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. We sure did. We're back here after enjoying the Thanksgiving holiday. And of course, a lot of football to break down. NFL, college, might talk a little World Cup and the NBA as well. But let's start with the NFL and Tim's Giants because they took a loss against the Cowboys. Before that, somehow they lost to Zoe's Detroit Lions. Now they're seven and four which I still feel like is going to be safe to get them into the playoffs, but they're definitely not playing at the same pace as earlier in the season. Do you think that's about the schedule they're playing right now, or are they kind of coming back to earth here down this latter stretch of the season? Well, I don't exactly think it's coming back to earth. I truly think that the Giants now are starting to get to the point of the schedule where, let's be honest, they're starting to actually play good football teams here towards the end of the year. And listen, I understand, you know, they face teams like Green Bay and Baltimore that we all thought they were going to lose to at the start of the year, Tennessee to name another. But when it's all said and done, you know, the Giants stand out this season. You have two games against Philadelphia two games against Washington, you have a very winnable game against Indianapolis, and you have a game against Minnesota. So we're talking about arguably the best team in the – well, I shouldn't say the best team, but one of the best teams in the NFC um, of, you know, Minnesota. You have right now what I argue is the best team in the NFC, uh, and, of course, the NFC East right now, the Philadelphia Eagles. And then, again, you look at Washington, they are playing really, really good football, and you can't discredit that. The fact of the matter is you know at the end of the day every single nfc east team is in the playoff picture so that's also what makes it relatively interesting but i think this game is definitely going to be a telling telling tale because listen the one thing i will say about this uh eddie and i'm not saying this is an excuse because the giants just haven't played good enough complimentary football over the last two games but i will say this the Giants, outside of losing Dory Jackson after that injury um, a few weeks back on the punt return, is actually starting to get healthy. For example, there is a very good optimistic chance that we will see Daniel Bellinger back this week, their tight end member who had the eye injury, who was very, very involved in the offense to open up the season. Uh, there's a very good chance that we could see Aziz Ojolari back uh, for the first time since his early season injury, in which, you know, we can't forget Aziz Ojolari for the Giants last season. He was arguably the bright spot of the defense as a pass rusher. I think he still has a lot of potential left and had injuries that just bugged him all season. So the fact that we get to see him and Kayvon Thibodeau together, and by the way, we saw them pretty much in the preseason be dominant i'm not saying that that's going to be the case again but i'm saying overall there's a lot of potential for this giants team the only real question truthfully is the secondary and i'll say this because i said this last weekend during thanksgiving and i went on a rant on it over and over again you want to win a football game against washington you want to win you want to make the playoffs this season if you're a giants fan listen the whole odell stuff aside which we'll maybe talk about in a little bit my thing is this is that you on third downs, not even offense. Listen, I know the offense didn't play as good enough as what it needs to against Dallas, but on third downs defensively, you cannot continue to do the same stuff over and over again like you're the New York Yankees and believe in insanity and expect different results to happen off the same exact execution. Because at the end of the day, I can't tell you how many times I wish I had the stats. I really do have to take some time to go back and look into it, but I can guarantee you the giants on third and 10 or fourth and 10 and longer. I guarantee you have a succession rate the, uh, 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 for opponents having a succession rate over them defensively of over 75%. The giants were one for four, one for four in the, in the game against Dallas on Thanksgiving. That's just unacceptable. And it's not the only time. I, Raheel and I have talked about it every single week this season. So it's not like it's just that past week. It, it comes in bunches. The Giants did a good job, might I add, to forcing turnovers against Dallas. And this will be the last point I make, Eddie. I, listen, the defense hasn't been big for creating interceptions, but I'll say it like this. If the Giants can continue to produce turnovers and pressure on Taylor Heineke and other quarterbacks moving forward, the Giants can win games. So with that being said, I feel confident that this team can still play productive football through December. Do I think this team is a playoff team? Listen, I, I don't know. 
I think that the weakness of the schedule makes it a good possibility. But if I'm being realistic with myself, I can only see the Giants winning two or three more games on this schedule. And Washington's not an easy victory. So with that being said, I'd be happy with a nine and eight season. But at the same time, I want to see this team win 10 and 11 games. And for the record, Odell coming to the locker room a little bit. Not, of course, he's not signed, but coming here today, creating a little bit of motivation because it was a big talk about for the Giants during practice today. I think it played a huge factor moving forward because I, I'm not trying to get delusional for a moment. I, I don't want to jump into the conversation about that yet either. But there's just something so odd about this Odell whole signing process to me that it's like the Giants are the least likely to get him. But it also feels like he, they're the most likely to get him in, a, in an odd in an odd way. It, it just I don't know how to explain it, but it just feels like Odell to the Giants is a very strong possibility. I think it's a possibility. I think he's going to Dallas. Let's talk about it. First of all, oh, I don't know, but okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. First of all, I just want to say it might be a little more difficult now for the Giants to get to 11 and six. Still definitely possible. I've been saying from the beginning, they're going to split the two with the Eagles. So we'll see how that all shakes out. And of course they start against Washington this week, the commanders who all of a sudden are in playoff position. The, the whole NFC East currently would make the postseason. So that's going to be interesting to pay attention to if Washington with Heineke can win some big games down the stretch, but Odell Beckham Jr. He's going to, whoever signs him, he's going to make a difference for them because I feel like it's been now 10 months since he was injured in the Super Bowl. That's usually about the recovery time for an ACL. And even if he doesn't do a lot, he's going to do something that's going to help a team out. And obviously the Giants need him most because we've seen how horrible the receiving core is for the Giants and the ones who play well get hurt. So they need Odell Beckham Jr. there, not only just because of his talent, but, you know, the history there, the fact that he's played for them before, the fact that he's played meaningful games in blue before for them and provide Daniel Jones a reliable veteran to throw the ball to, fans will be pumped up for it. That being said, I kind of feel like people were saying this on Twitter, that what happened on Thanksgiving was going to be a telltale sign for Odell Beckham Jr. Because at this stage of OBJ's career and coming in late in the season, what does he want? He wants to win a ring. So I feel like the Cowboys, as much as I hate to say it, have a better chance to win a Super Bowl with this roster than the Giants. And in some ways, I'd even say than the Eagles, even though I think the Eagles are still going to win the NFC East, just because the Cowboys, I feel like their roster is constructed better for the postseason. And Odell Beckham Jr. is coming off of a serious injury the second time he's torn his ACL. If he comes to the Giants, whether he wants to or not, he's going to be expected to be probably their main target because uh, aside from Darius Slayton, there's nobody else you can reliably ask to catch the ball and hold onto the ball on the Giants roster. With the Cowboys, they have a much deeper receiving core. They're still in need, but there is more reliable pieces beyond C.D. Lamb. So Odell Beckham can fit into a wide receiver two or three role, which he excelled in last year with the Los Angeles Rams. So at this point, I feel like Dallas is going to end up being the place where Odell Beckham Jr. is playing football. Well, see, I, again, and I'm not saying because I'm a giant fan, I just truly don't think he's going to go to Dallas. And I know it sounds like, oh, you know, Dallas, the battle. It, it's the whole topic of conversation upon media. But I really put the two destinations down to two places. I think it's either Buffalo or New York and the Giants. I don't think he wants to be anywhere else but New York, to be quite frank. I mean, again, he's established. I mean, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, Odell Beckham actually still owns a residency in some places in New Jersey, New York, if I'm not mistaken. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, but he played a whole season on the complete other side of the country. Right, last right, right, right. But the, the point is, is for him, you want to talk about transitioning and moving. It's a lot easier for him to stay in New York, even if he plays for the Bills and, let's say, still lives in New York. It's still a lot easier for him to be a resident of New York State than it would be for him to be in Buffalo. And again, I get Odell's a lot of money. Does that really matter? No. But at the end of the day, again, I'm not saying that he's going to be a giant, but it's just like, it almost feels like the fact that, because the fact of the matter is this, a lot of the telling tale when you talk about free agents, a lot of the times places they go to first are usually the places they have most interest of. And it's very interesting because the reason why I say this, the Giants had a two-day meeting with Odell. Not one. Every other team, to my knowledge, is only getting a one-day meeting with Odell. So I want you to think about it like this. I, I, again, 
I, to me, it's just a little bit odd that the Giants are getting the most opportunity to get a say on Odell. And it, it, it just, it's very hard because, again, he'll go one day, he'll spend one day down in Dallas, and we'll see what happens again. Jerry could, you know, do something with money and say, hey, I want you as my wide receiver. But I just don't see him as a fit in Dallas. I really don't. And, and I'm not saying that he's not good enough to be in Dallas. I just don't think it's Odell's style. Buffalo, you have Von Miller, someone he's comfortable with. I, I truly think it's this. Is Odell Super Bowl hunting? Yes. But I also think Odell's realistic of he wants places where he has a comfortable coaching experience and a good relationship. And the one reason why Odell left Cleveland in frustration and also, let's be quite frank, left New York in frustration was because of coaching dysfunction. Let's not act like there isn't coaching dysfunction in Dallas. So you can't forget about that either, which is why I think it's down to Buffalo in New York in regards to the two places he's going to be. And listen, for the record, I wouldn't be upset if he's a Buffalo Bill. It makes sense. I can't discredit Josh Allen and everything they're doing up there. But my God, I'd be lying if I didn't say I didn't want him to be a New York Giant. And I'm not saying it because I hate the Dallas Cowboys. Just At the end of the day, listen. You know, you, you need to do whatever you can to win a Super Bowl, but I just don't think it's realistic for Odell. I also feel like there's another layer to this too, because it really depends, and we don't know this yet, what exactly Odell is looking for in a contract. Because is he looking for something that wraps into 2023? Or is he looking for a rental for the end of the season to prove that he's still got a skill set? And then so, maybe... So, 20... I was just saying, to my knowledge from and i could be wrong because the nfl is constantly changing but any in-season free agent past the offseason that's signed cannot sign a multiple year contract so every contract that he would sign would not tie in next year would only be specific for this season okay he would have to sign the the offseason then that proves my point of why the giants are less likely to get him because i feel like dallas and, and sure buffalo I feel like those are two better chances for him to get a Super Bowl and prove his experience. I'm not ruling him out going back to the Giants. In fact, I think it's very likely he catches on with the team that goes on a playoff run. He makes some big catches down the stretch in the regular season, plays a postseason game or two, maybe goes all the way, depending on which team he's on, we'll see, and then looks for his next contract. And the Giants, looking for a receiver in 2023, bring him in. But I think the best opportunity for Odell potentially to showcase himself, not be hampered or hindered by anything, would be to go to one of these other teams. Because with the Giants, there would just be too much of a weight on his shoulders of a player who has not stepped on a football field in 10 months to instantly be the savior. Because Giants fans remember that catch he made eight years ago. And when you don't, when Kenny Galladay has been terrible Sterling Shepard is out for the year Richie James keeps fumbling there's nobody aside from Darius Slayton and Saquon out of the backfield that can really catch a ball from Daniel Jones and Odell Beckham Jr. would have a lot of weight on his shoulders so I feel like he might lean towards the Dallas situation or a Buffalo situation where he knows yeah I'm going to get targets but at the same time there are other guys who are going to be there that are going to lead the way whether it be Stefan Diggs or CeeDee Lamb just like where I excelled with the Rams. And if I stay healthy, I prove I can still contribute, then I might be able to get a nice contract. And then the Giants in 2023, who will be looking for receiving help, can add Odell Eldell plus another piece or two and give Daniel Jones weapons for next season because the Giants are in the beginning of an up and up and over the next couple of years are going to be a good team. And bringing back Odell Beckham Jr. would be huge. I just don't see it happening right now. But let's. Yeah, but yeah, I just want to say, I want to say one last thing because I also watched a couple of the interviews today from the players, particularly with Sterling Shepard and Saquon Barkley. And the one thing that I think Saquon Barkley mentioned that I, to me actually really, really stood out, which again, not saying the Giants are going to get him, but at the end of the day, one thing that Saquon said is that, you know, Odell, I, he said, I'd be lying if I said I didn't want someone that's like a best friend to me back in the locker room. And of course, again, I mentioned friendship, his relationship, so on. That's not that important. I mean, it's important, but it's not that important to him signing to the team. But the big thing that he brought up was that he mentioned that Odell, as an individual getting to know him, prefers to make other people better, not people making him better. So think about that for a second. Because if you think about it like this, and again, I'm not, again, I'm not saying that again, but if Odell's the number one receiver for the Giants, that takes a lot of load off Saquon Barkley. All of a sudden, that can make Saquon Barkley better. That can make Darius Slayton better. 
and can make almost any other receiver better, which again goes to the point of leadership and caring. And again, I'm not saying again, Odell is going to go into a situation where he doesn't want to do the opposite, but again, getting to know a person over time, like Saquon Barkley has, I just find it interesting to be that way that maybe things could have changed for Odell. And again, I'm not saying that players don't change or do change, but I, I just, again, it feels odd. It feels very odd to me, which getting to listen to what Saquon had to say today, again, it, it doesn't make me optimistic that the Giants are going to get Odell Beckham Jr., but it just makes it interesting. Because if you truly think about Buffalo, is Odell making Stefan Diggs better? Is Odell making, you know, Gabe Davis better? You would think it's going to be the opposite in that situation. And, okay, I can, I can argue a little bit in Dallas, if you want to make argue the contrary, that he maybe could be making C.D. Uh, CD Lamb a little bit better and Michael Gallup a little bit better. But uh, in terms of a wide, wide variety of playmakers, in terms of dual threats, again, the fit would be with the Giants because he'd make almost everyone instantly better on that team. Let's shift, let's stay at MetLife Stadium, but shift to the other team, the New York Jets, who made the surprising move to bench Zach Wilson after they lost to the Patriots for the second time this season. Uh, it was a really bad loss, 10-3, and Zach Wilson had a controversial press conference where they basically asked him, do you feel culpable at all for not scoring many points? And Zach Wilson straight up said no. Robert Sala benched him in favor of Mike White, and they beat the Bears, who we're playing with someone with a strained oblique with Trevor Simeon at quarterback, but White threw for three. He just had, yards he, he just had that season-ending surgery today. Yeah, out he's out for the season now. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so it's unbelievable. But, which means there's a chance Nathan Peterman might actually start this weekend if Fields isn't healthy, but they're saying Fields is probably going to play. Uh, I wanted to see a Nate. I really wanted to see Nathan Peterman versus Mike. I White. don't want to Peterman chance, man. I really do. And it's not because he's a living meme. It's just a simple fact that, listen, Nasty Nate really did not get an opportunity like we thought in Buffalo. And to be fair, he didn't really have the targets back then in Buffalo. So I, I would love to see him get a fair shot. And again, I know theoretically the Bears, outside of Claypool, don't really have anything spectacular like what Buffalo... I mean, granted, he didn't play. I don't think he played the digs there in Buffalo yet, right? Not, that was after the first season. So it was like, it's, it's not like he had you know, those massive targets. But at the end of the day, I, I'm excited if Nathan Peterman gets a shot. And I really am rooting for Nathan Peterman. I actually would love to see him, you know, get an opportunity to turn it into a somewhat success story, even if he's a career backup. Kind of like, to be honest, kind of like Taylor Heineke. And I know it sounds crazy, but Heineke, I mean, you think about it. All it took was Heineke, Heineke one playoff start to change everyone's opinion on him. And granted, he started the season as a backup, but what is he doing for Washington now? But um, the Jets? I, I, I don't know what to think. There's a good chance they could beat Minnesota this week. There's a very, very good chance they could beat Minnesota this week. But, and, and it comes down to the fact of what Mike White, version of Mike White, are you going to see? Uh, are you going to see the the second coming of Mike White like you did last season where he, what, what was it, like 400 yards the first week and then he turns around and he can't even find 100 yards and throws like three interceptions the second game? Uh, are we going to see that Mike White? Now, I would like to point out, he did that last year against the top five Buffalo Bills defense. The, the Vikings are not a top five defense in the league, especially if they get passed on a lot. Um, ha has that defense this season. So I'd like to think they're going to be a little bit more productive. But I just feel like Minnesota is – because they were so under the radar this offseason with everything they've done. I personally – I think when we did our predictions, I, that was a team that I said, hey, they look good, but I didn't think they were going to win a division. I thought they were going to be just above 500. This team's really open eyes. Really, really open eyes. And at the end of the day, again, I really think the Vikings are a powerhouse. And I'm not saying the Jets aren't going to compete, but I think this is going to be one of those three-point games where the Jets' defense keeps them in. But Mike White is going to be the difference maker, in my opinion. And also, to be honest, the run game, because they, they're not going to have Michael Carter. Who knows what's happening with James Robinson? Since they've traded for him, he's done absolutely nothing for them. And uh, who, who was the running back last week? I don't remember his name. I just know Xavier, I picked him up. Xavier days. Knight. Xavier yeah, Knight. Yeah. He very well may be starting this week. And which, listen, it could be very good for the Jets. But at the end of the day, if you don't know what's going on offensively, that makes me a little bit worried. So with that being said, I'm eager to see what happens. That's definitely going to be a must-watch game. But for the Jets, it's a must-win. Because let's be honest, with Buffalo winning this week, you have an opportunity. I think they would jump um, 
they would jump New England, right? If they if they were to win this week, they would have to be ahead the- of New England because they're yeah. seven and four. New England lost last night to go to six and six. So six. yeah. Their worry isn't really the AFC East. Their worry, I think, I think their biggest challenge right now is the Chargers. Because when you look at the AFC playoff picture, Bills and Dolphins are getting in. I think both the Ravens and the Bengals are going to confidently get in. South has to get a team, and it's going to be Tennessee. And then the West, you've got the Chiefs obviously going to win it. And then I think it's really between the Chargers and the Jets at this point for who gets that other playoff spot. So that's their main worry. And both those teams have flaws. And obviously the Jets just benched their starting quarterback. And it's starting to look like Sam Darnold all over again here with Zach Wilson. And I really wonder if Mike White plays well down the stretch, if that's really the end of Zach Wilson, which would be shocking after his second season. And a lot of people thought there was some promise with him at the very least at the end of last year. And they were like, well, all the rookies struggled last year. Fields had a bad year. Lawrence had a bad year. Maybe Wilson can turn it around. And despite the team having a good record, a lot of that is not because of Wilson. It's been because of their run game. And it's because of their defense. And I, uh, you know, now, now you look ahead here. If Mike White can do this, he's so far four career NFL starts. Two have been great. Two have been bad. So against the Vikings, don't really know. Minnesota has been really Jekyll and Hyde over the last three games. I mean, lost by 37 to Dallas, but had the thrilling win over Buffalo and pretty much shut down New England on Thanksgiving. So I'm going to be really curious to see how this works out. But that's all I've got on the NFL right now. I will talk a little about the Sportsbeak Fantasy League, of course, because uh, we have to touch on that because the playoffs are coming very soon. And there was a lot of surprising results last week. A lot of kind of upset results in week number 12. I had a horrible loss because I was up by 28 going into the Monday night football game. And I ended up losing by two points to Nick Pochia, who has now won three in a row to get to four and eight. And he has been setting his lineup, I know. So um, he got up to four and eight, but he left Justin Fields in. He forgot that. So I was playing against someone who didn't even have a quarterback in, and I still lost. Joshua Franks got his second win of the season against T-Glass, which is hilarious because that pretty much knocks T-Glass out of any sort of contention. He's four and eight now. Franks gets his second win. Tim, you lost to Team Zo freaking good, 138 to 32. We have a three-way tie for first now. And whoever, realistically, whoever loses is going to probably, over the next two weeks, going to miss the playoffs because I don't think, and, and for the record, I think Zoe has to play Bellows, and I have to play Bellows to round out the season. So that's not going to be good because one of us are going to miss out. And if I'm being honest, it's probably going to be me. Yeah. Raheel's team is insane. They're up to 11 and 1. He dominated Bellows. And I haven't really looked at Raheel's roster, but it's pretty obvious the way his roster ended up. And mind you, he did not have Jamar Chase or Joe Mixon since they were both out last week. But he had Jalen Hurts as his quarterback, and his receivers are Justin Jefferson and Stephon Diggs, and he flexed Metcalf in to get 20 points. So he's got an insane receiving core. Bellows' team with Burrow and Saquon, Olave, pretty good roster too, Travis Kelsey, but he falls to 9-3, and three, and Miniker just can't win anything. Fifth straight loss, he's 1-11, and 11, he falls to Drew, 128-107. to 107. So let's look at the standings. And like you said, yeah, three-way tie in the East. Me, you, and Zoe are all eaten for. The other two are out of contention. This week, what do we have? I'm playing against Franks, who's only projected to get 56 points. So that should be a victory for me. Zoe's against Bellows. Bellows is favored by 15 points. And then you're against Pochia, who, yes, has been playing better lately, but you're still favored by like 20 points. So I really think this could be a week where me and you win and Zoe might come up short, but the game against Bellows, those are two really good teams. Right. And I do want to remind you this, unlike a typical fantasy league, the way it was set up for this year is that I emphasize head to head records as deciding a breaker. Well, the reason why I say it causes chaotic is guess what? Zoe and I split this season. You and I, if I'm not mistaken, also split this season. So at the end of the day, it could come down to points four. I don't know. I honestly don't know how ESPN decides to break her after that. So needless to say, um, it could be very, very, very interesting for the playoffs. If it, I'm assuming you're going to win out, but it's going to come down to who doesn't lose the Bellows either this week or next week. Well, and I, play, I, I think play. I have a lot. 
I play Bellows next week. So it's wait, I don't play Bellows next week. No, I do. Who do I play next? Uh, let's see. That's a good question. Let's pull it up. But I, I played Bellows. No, you play Drew next week. Oh, wow. So I have the easiest schedule then. Yes, you do. So I don't know what you're complaining is about here. I have to play Bellows next week. And I, that also, by the way, I just checked on the tiebreakers. You and Zoe split, me and you split, and me and Zoe split. So all of it is like a one on one. So we have no idea how these tiebreakers are going to work out. Um, In the West, it's pretty settled out. Raheel basically clinched the West over Bellows with his win last week. So he's 11 and one Bellows nine and three and Drew's uh, all the way back at five and seven. So that's, that that's set. It's Raheel first Bellows second, the East though. Is are, are we put in for last place? I feel like we have to come up with something. We have to discuss that with the group chat. If you're listening, if you're watching this, you have any suggestions for our punishment for last place, let us know, let us know. But uh, we will have to, we will have to consider that further, but we're, we definitely have to have one. Unfortunately, it's probably going to end up being Miniker. So anyway, and the sad thing too is that he's behind people like Franks and Poach who at times have just straight up not set their lineups. Miniker has been trying. He has he tried. He has tried to get the roster better. But again, this is what happens when you draft players who are on your favorite team. Now, of course, we had a gimmick draft. So yes, some of that fell under the gimmick rules. But that's what happens when you build majority of your roster on the Denver Broncos, because listen, if it was the Broncos defense, actually, well, the Broncos defense, surprisingly, are not really that good of a fantasy defense, although we know they're one of the top defenses in the league this year. Yeah, because they hold people down in points, but they don't get takeaways. That's the thing. Right, right, exactly. And it's like, so the Broncos defense is really, really good. You know, their, their special teams is really, really good, but anything around that, has not been good and especially if you drafted at the start of the year you took Williams Williams got hurt uh if you took Melvin Gordon he's not on the roster anymore you know the receiving core is inconsistent on a weekly basis and as we know the quarterback play has been absolutely poor so at the end of the day it's definitely interesting (laughs) if if you drafted Broncos players it's almost honestly almost as frustrating in my opinion Eddie as uh people drafting Darnell Mooney uh, Darnell Mooney in fantasy because now it went from all-time low to losing face to, oh, my God, he's playing good to, oh, my God, he's on the IR. You don't even know the the problems that Darnell Mooney has caused me this season because in my money league that I'm in with my friends in college, I drafted Mooney as my number two wide receiver. And literally every week that I started him, he did nothing. The three weeks I benched him, he had like 15-plus points, and then now he's out for the year. So I, 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 I had no idea what to do. Now he's off my roster. So I, I'm just I'm kind of glad it's over. In my money league, I ended up starting the season with a variety of running backs that ended up either losing their starting role, for example, Antonio Gibson, who, by the way, for the record, still not bad. James mm-hmm. Robinson um, lost his role. And it's like, yeah, great. I had Aaron Jones, but he's been inconsistent. So it's like I'm working with a very poor running back system. I have no good tight end. I actually ended up getting Dalton Schultz somehow in the waiver wire, which I have no idea how he was there. And thank God, because I almost I ended up picking up Darren Waller, but then he got put on IR. So that was really, really good for me that I almost didn't or I chose to not do that, but it's like, I've been getting bailed by Justin Jefferson. By the way, in that league, I drafted Aaron Rodgers, having faith that he played good quarterback. My starting quarterback is now Daniel Jones, and actually he's getting benched this week for Deshaun Watson. So (laughs) at the end of the day, in my money league, it's not looking bad, but it's not looking too good either. And I, I will say this, I was able to get Garrett Wilson on a free agency earlier on the season. He's turned out to be a good signing for me. Um, Tyler Boyd has been a disappointment after starting off the year good. But thank God Hollywood Brown is back. Because when he comes back from the bye week next week, he may be the savior for my fantasy team. Because Deontay Johnson, let me tell you, I cannot stand the Pittsburgh Steelers anymore with how inconsistent he is just it's a frustrating year because my money league is so so balanced and it's frustrating when i've scored the second or third most points but i've also allowed the second most points on the season so it's definitely not good 
Yeah, and Deontay Johnson's got some crazy stat. He's like got like 96 catches and no touchdowns this year. So that's unfortunate for him. A few minutes left in the show. Let's shift to college football. It is conference championship weekend, and Michigan with a huge win over Ohio State. Now the Buckeyes are in trouble. And basically, I think this playoff this year, I'm so glad they're going to a 12-team format, but I think this year's four teams, it's going to be balanced. Because Georgia has looked very vulnerable at, that, at times. They almost got upset by Missouri. They were losing to Georgia Tech at halftime. Uh, Michigan probably is the best team, in my opinion. If I were to rank them right now, I'd put Michigan one. I'd put Georgia two. Because TCU is undefeated, I don't care what people feel about the Big 12. I'd put TCU third. And right now, I'd say USC fourth. If either of those teams lose their conference championship, Ohio State immediately is inserted into the playoff, in my opinion. Even if Michigan or Georgia lose their conference ter- conference championship, they're still in, but Ohio State's going to jump in if USC or TCU fall. But I feel like TCU has earned the chance. They've played ranked teams. They've played ranked teams well. If they lose to Kansas State, prove me wrong. But I feel like a Big 12 team, the Big 12 outside of Oklahoma continuously gets mistreated by the committee and the Horned Frogs deserve it. Oh, I I agree in that regard. I still don't know if I'll jump Michigan over Georgia only for the reason of this. Listen, yeah, it's great. Michigan's playing good football, but how many times do we have to play this tune over and over again? Our ball's team does not come up in the clutch when it matters. And listen, they're going to get to the playoffs and they're going to choke again. And it's that simple. I'm not saying that because I'm an Ohio state fan. Cause I, I know it comes off like that, but it, it's just what Michigan does every year. And until I see a turnaround, that I'm convinced, then I'll truthfully believe that Michigan's a national title threat this season. But I, I still feel Georgia, their only downfall is they play down to opponents, which is not a good thing. Um, but with that being said, when they get to meaningful football, I feel like they have an opportunity to really make a statement. But I, again, who knows what happens when they get to SEC championship time? They very well could lose, and while well, they could still be in the top four, you know, they very well could lose the one and it could create chaos. But I agree with you in regards to one through four, and it's going to come down for Ohio State. I mean, let's be honest, for Ohio State, they were bound to lose this year. They're not playing good. Well, like, they're playing good football, but they're not playing good football to, in terms of vulnerability. They've played down a lot this season. They, they've played very inconsistent where they've had drives of, you know, a good first half, and then they fade the second, vice versa. You know, listen, I know that Strav looks like a very promising quarterback for the NFL level, but at the end of the day, that team outside of its quarterback has not been what it was anticipated to be at the start of the year. So that with that being said for Ohio State, um, you know, I, I think that a lot of luck will probably fall in his favor because it typically does come in the late season. But at the end of the day, I just, I don't know, because I feel like, you know, compared to last season, where it felt like, and even earlier on this year, um, where it felt like we were having upset after upset after upset after upset, I just kind of feel like the dramatics are kind of done at this point until we get to the championship games, because I just, like, I just don't feel like, like, I should, I should say until we get to the championship games, until we get through most of the important championship games, I should say. Because I just don't feel like, really, at this point, the, like, the college football playoffs are a story, obviously. But compared to past seasons, I don't really feel like, because we've seen so much chaos go on at this point in the season, that it's like, you can expect anything crazier to happen. But then again, it's college football, so who knows? Yeah, you never know. Personally, I think Georgia and Michigan are not getting upset. I know Purdue has a history of beating teams that are number two in the country. But guess what? When they were number one, Rutgers Scarlet Knights right back there, Ron Harper Jr. beat them in basketball. So I'm still happy about that. But we'll see what happens, and we'll break down the college football playoff more as it gets closer. Let's close with this. Of course, the World Cup's going on. United States, thrilling victory over Iran, hanging on in the final minutes to be able to advance out of the group stage into the knockout stage. Going to be facing off with the Netherlands tomorrow. Christian Pulisic has suddenly turned into a national hero. And for the United States, I think this is just so huge. As the U.S. continues to embrace soccer and it becomes more popular here now to see that there is homegrown talent that can contend remember the u.s didn't qualify for the world cup four years ago now they're back 
and they draw with England, they draw with Wales and get a clutch win over Iran to move on. And I don't see them going far. Personally, I think they're going to lose to the Netherlands tomorrow. But the fact that they at least made it out of the group stage into the knockout stage still says a lot about this team, especially since the national team right now is so young. Yeah, it absolutely does. And, you know, for example, just Polisic being here, it's honestly very equivalent to, if you remember, with what happened with Tim Howard. You know, just a, 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 how, how long ago was the Tim Howard stuff? Was that eight years ago, I want to say? Eight years ago, yeah. Eight years ago. So it's like, it, it's just he himself has become an icon, not just for U.S., but in terms of the World Cup, just for, again, I mean, he, he goes down with what looks to be a horrific injury and then comes back. It's like, it, it's remarkable, but it shows it, it, not, not just in terms of American terms, but it's the fact of it's the most patriotic thing, as they like to say, you see, he's putting it all on the line for his country. Oh, I apologize. Uh, good old battery thing likes to pop up, but uh, you know, he's putting it on the line for his country and that's, you know, respectable at the end of the day. And, you know, I, again, I agree with you. I don't really think us talent wise is still there to win a world cup, but it's good to see the steps in the right direction moving forward. Um, I would like to see them uh, get further than tomorrow, but realistically speaking, I agree with you in the regards to they're probably going to lose tomorrow. But I think at the end of the day, regardless of the result, we should just be proud of the fact that we've put a soccer team capable of getting to, you know, to this point in the World Cup. And at the end of the day, again, it's, it's far better than what it was four years ago, but I don't think we should overset the boundaries and expectations. I honestly go to the standard of this, just like I talk about sports all the time, especially with the Yankees. Um, and what frustrates me about them is you can only learn from failure and you can only build around that through that moment to eventually build success. I think the same thing can be said about the World Cup. And granted, I know U.S. wants to win one so, so badly, but sometimes failure can be your best medicine to building that chemistry to get to one. Well, that'll be it. We'll wait to see what happens tomorrow in Doha as the U.S. faces off with the Netherlands in round one of the knockout stage in the World Cup. Stay tuned for next week. Probably going to have some baseball news. Winter meetings next week. Aaron Judge, Jacob deGrom, a lot of other free agents out there. Going to be interesting to see how that all works out. NFL, college football playoff as well. But until next time, I'm Eddie Kalegi. And I'm Tim Moore. Signing off of Sports Speak. We hope you have a great rest of your weekend.